Okay, we will get started. Welcome everyone to Lake Champlain Waldorf School to our middle and high school observation morning. We're so happy to have you and to be able to have the opportunity virtually to give you a glimpse into a day in the life of a middle and high schooler here. So it's not how we typically do things, but this, um, this way has its own advantages, which we will see. And we're excited to welcome you and to introduce you to faculty, which will happen a little bit later, um, and let you submit your own questions through the Q&A feature, which you should see on your screen. This is also being recorded for later viewing. If uh, there are any of um, anyone that you would like to share this with, you will receive a recording of this event as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing with you a video. These are our students offering you a tour of our Boswick Road campus. And I hope you enjoy their view into their school. Hi, welcome to our high school. <laughs> this is the lobby where we come in in the morning and say hi to our teachers. Here we are in the lounge. We've got some cozy couches. We got an upstairs lounge balcony and stairs down. To sit down. <laughs> <laughs> this is the sun right there. Hi, my son. Hello. Hi. 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 Here is our kitchen. We've had some classes in here that have been really fun. Uh, we'll do some like baking and like French class or something, but um, normally we would have lunch being made, but right now because of COVID, we can't do that. But, yeah. Um, can you, when you get a chance, can you look over my, um, this is like a fun hallway with some benches and windows that we hang out in sometimes. Very cozy. And great hall. Yeah. Yeah. Students will hang out in here. Um, it's a great space to be. I mean, Students, a lot of us know how to play the piano, so there's usually some music going on. Um, someone was banging on the drums sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we really like to put a lot of art up around our school so we can see what everyone else is up to and just display it and make it a nice space to be in. Library. Kids can study in here or write a paper, get some books, talk to teachers. Amount of things. Hi, Krimi. Hi, Hi Mr. Krimi. How are you? Here we have another class. Where we're going. Lesson in, in here right now. Um, this is like a typical classroom that we've got. Another piano, obviously. There's like three of them in here. <laughs> <laughs> Hubby 
the area are all over the place. Elevator. Elevator. <laughs> Seniors are in here learning like, optics or something like that. Um, are working on making some kind of pot right now. Uh, high schoolers, except for the seniors, uh, we're working on kind of like an independent project. Bookshelf like a, table. It's just a challenge. We only get 10 feet of board, and then we have to create something out of that. Uh, we've got all of our machinery and tools and workspaces. This is where the seniors are doing their senior portrait. Yep. Senior portrait time, so we're working pretty hard on them. So this is what the ninth and tenth graders worked on in their block. But we've done drawing and painting in here last year. Oh, we did print making in here. Over here is just another classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Any more pianos? <laughs> this is a piano in classroom. A rarity. Sure. Right now, people are eating lunch on this hill that we eat on the floor sometimes. Um, over there is our volleyball net. We love to play volleyball after we eat it. It gets pretty wild. Everyone likes to participate. Uh, that would be So now I'd like to share with you um, a glimpse into some of the classes across our all, a wide range of subjects at our school. And you'll be seeing um, the very beginning, a glimpse into Monday morning meeting. And that's something that happens on Monday morning every week. And this year you uh, will notice that we're doing it outdoors. So it requires um, handling a little bit differently, social distancing and a little bit more work on the part of our teachers to make this meeting happen. And then you will get to see classes in action. So I will share my screen once again. If what you've done is stupid, but it works, 
then it really isn't all that stupid. Thank you. You're here. In addition to David Letterman, Miss Sun was born on this day. Ew. Not that long ago. Tonight is the illustrious Alia McManaway talking about um, talking about clothing and beauty in clothing and celebrating the human form. Yeah. And that's at seven. At, at seven o'clock tonight online. So look for the links. They were in the last week's newsletter. And then the cosine function starts at one, comes down to negative one, and goes back up to one. Right? And we talked about that the other day. So today we want to talk about derivatives related to these. So what are derivatives? The slope of the line. The slope of the line. So let's start by looking at the sine function. So that's the green one. What can you tell me about the slope of the sine function? Periodical. It's a, it has a period, yep. It's going to repeat itself. So we know that the derivative will also have to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. right? It zeroes out at two points? Yep, so it hits a maximum here, and it hits a minimum here. It's Why do you say that? I did say it two days ago. It's true. But yes, you can see that where the, co uh, the sine function is hitting those maxes, we remember that the derivative at that point is zero because literally the slope stops before it comes back down. And that should be lined up exactly with where this is zero and where this is zero. You can also see that the slope at this point, the slope is actually decreasing here as it comes in towards the maximum. So you can see the slope is decreasing if this is measuring the slope. Then we come down here. You probably got right here, if you remember what we call that when the slope stops going down and starts curving up when it starts, when it changes the curve. The inflection point, right? So the inflection point is here, and that's going to line up with where the cosine actually changes its direction because that's where the slope changes direction. So you can map the different points. So we end up knowing that the derivative of sine t is equal to cosine. Hello, I'm Tyler McDonald, and I'm the movement teacher here at Lake Champlain Waldorf School. In fifth grade, we have the pentathlon where many students, well, all the students work on uh, javelin, discus, long jump, the, uh, the sprint, relay, and we really work on form and the spirit of the games. And then in the sixth grade and in the middle school, we bring in a sport that has exactness within the rules and exactness within the technique. Uh, for example, with basketball, how to sh properly shoot a basketball. Um, if you step on the line, you're out. Some more rig rigid rules that come along with sport um, are really introduced and embraced in the sixth grade and moving forward. So seventh and eighth and, and onward, we work on these, these sports and games, volleyball, ultimate frisbee, um, soccer. But we also uh, leave room for imagination and play within the games using our skills that we may have used um, with passing and catching and introducing different different games that we have um, and each class sometimes come up with their own games within those 
uh, skills that they've learned. With the eighth grade, I just played a game that uh, combined a game that we play here at Waldorf called Spaceball, which is very similar to other invasion games where you're passing the ball around trying to get 10 passes in a row, but you're um, holding your own personal space and respecting the others. So the defense has to uh, keep that space. And we added in um, goals from soccer and rules that are very similar to Ultimate Frisbee. And we went down, up and down the field um, combining those and it was great fun. So along with learning the traditional sports, we also have room for, for play. And while always re respecting each other, um, holding it a safe place to try something new. And it's always a pleasure to watch these young athletes um, blossom as, as athletes and particularly as teammates and really learn um, all the social importance of helping each other out that can go um, on far past the, the playing fields or the basketball court. It's a real honor and pleasure teaching here and I, I really love every moment with the students. So my name is Emily Laird and I have been teaching at the Waldorf School for about 17 years. I'm a practicing artist and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the senior portraits as a culminating gesture for um, the experience at the Waldorf High School. Um, over here are preparatory drawings that the students work with their image. We start looking at um, proportions. They start with contour line drawings. First, we start with blind contour line drawings where you're actually not worried about how it's going to turn out. Then these are contour line drawings, charcoal drawings, pastels. The pastels are really to loosen up the color a little bit, to, um, it, it, they can be very fluid. And through the course of these exercises, they might start to get a glimpse of what their portrait uh, what they might be looking for in their portrait. One of the things I like to say is if they already know what it should look like, that's probably not the painting that they should do. That really what we're looking for is something undiscovered, something that they discover in the process. And the question um, for seniors really is, is um, who am I? And who am I becoming would be a, and the, the fact that we look in the mirror, they use the mirror instead of a photograph, which this year has been challenging. So they've been painting outside as much as they can they look in the mirror with this question, um, who am I? And who am I today? Who am I becoming? Um, what's being reflected back at me? It's a very different process than taking a selfie, choosing this expression, and then saying, I am that expression. You know, that's kind of a frozen moment. And the self-portrait, it's more dynamic and it's a discovery. Um, but there's something about really asking the question, you know, it's sort of like, um, who am I today? Fresh, not on this photograph I took three weeks ago, but wow, today when I look in the mirror, I'm feeling sad today and I'm carrying that, or I'm feeling a little anxious today and I'm carrying that. And, and that might or might not make it into their portrait. We caught the moment of questioning. And I think those moments of questioning, that dynamic quality, that's what um, a life full of growing and exploring is about. Because life isn't right like that we, we find the answer and that's the answer. That's not what life is. Life is this evolution that you know you have a job, you learn to work in that job, you grow some skill sets, something calls you to something else. So something that you can't you can't quite fathom and there's something beautiful about attending that process that you're attending the process of this movement and it's sort of depicted through the movement of developing the self-portrait that same kind of um there's a fluidity and a in a stepping into the unknown which is just different from i'm working from a photograph so that's something I feel like is um, very much related to this education. And I've had so many moments over these years where one, every student makes a powerful portrait. You know, there's just enough time you can really do that. And then there's some 
self-discovery, um, some reflection of who that student is and who that human is. Um, you see how many lines there are on that? You see how there's a lot of lines that went on a whole bunch of times. Right? You don't need goggles for this. They're still on the skip over. Pick it up to the battery. have a compass, right? So I'm, I, we're not going to just have the same effect. Right? Yeah, it, it's going to look like the same effect. It's not. You know, we know something different. We, shift it, but we don't have any way to tell. Okay? Great. So make sure you make some notes. suggest this to you. I wish we could do this. 
in a perfectly still body of water if you can get underneath and it's wide enough, you can't do this in a bathtub. You go under the water slowly and you look around, you'll see there's like a hole in the ice and the whole world is right there. But what's beautiful is, once you go beyond the edge of that, it's like a mirror. And all you see is silver or reflections of the bottom. It's really, it's almost like you fell through a hole in the ice. It's really kind of surreal. It's quite beautiful. And it will give you a sense for the fishes view of the world. A fish eye view. Have they made, are you any into photography or filming the fish eye lens? The fish eye lens takes the whole world and kind of compacts it into a smaller area. That's how, that's where it comes from. This is how the fish sees from a less dense to a more dense view. So, we've got one other element here that we can add that I think gives you a really interesting insight into how this all works. There's something called an index of refraction. You may have uh, measured this in class eight. Some of you were here in class eight. Remember this quarter we had in the bottom of the tank and it appeared lifted toward the surface? If we measure how much it appears lifted, compared to its physical density, its physical depth, and we take that ratio, we get something called the index of refraction. Essentially, it's comparing it to air. The air itself magnifies a tiny bit compared to a vacuum. So a vacuum has no lifting. So the ratio of the quarter seen through a vacuum to its physical depth is one to one. Air will lift it slightly. And now if you come to water, and these are approximate, the water will lift the image 31%. It will appear 31% closer in water than essentially air. Oh. Um, What's that, Edgar? Isn't it also 31% lighter when you're pulling up the water? The wave? Is the water 31% lighter? No, if you're holding the water. If I'm holding like a rock, I'm making that rock. But if I'm holding. It depends on what you're holding. Yeah, it's a density question. But it actually, it's kind of interesting to think about it that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I noticed that as a child when I built dams on streams. I could move real heavy rocks in the water that I couldn't move if I lifted them out of the water. Yeah, that's very interesting. Good insight. Okay, um, anyone know who has a stronger index of refraction in the water? Very good. So glass is about 1.54. It depends on the um, type of glass. So this is why if your eyesight is only moderately degraded, you can have soft contact lenses. Because that has water in it. It's just plastic covered in water. If your eyes need a stronger magnification, then you need glass contact lenses. And if your eyes are really struggling, instead of just glass, what do they give you? Glasses. Yeah, any of you have glasses with high index glass? Oh, are they the little things on the bottom that have little magnifiers? Uh, no, no, that's, that's bifocals, that's something different. Okay. But the high index glass is a glass that magnifies even more. So a high index glass might get close to 1.7. I think it's 1.6 something, but close to 1.7. And this means that now you can use glasses on so thick. And now here's like my, my wonderful 
personal scientific theory. When you think of glasses, and you think of really bad eyesight, what the pop culture figure for multiple decades almost makes it his signature that I have very poor eyesight, and so I need very large glasses. Can you read one question, Trey? Elton John. Elton John's the one I thought. Woo! Elton John's the one I'm thinking of. Now, Elton John is rich, like really rich. And if you have really bad eyesight and had a lot, a lot of money, you could actually make, I'm gonna have to write it on the side here, I'm sorry, I'd like to keep it in. The index of refraction of diamonds is about 2.42. And hold on to it, this will be your personal prism for the next 24, 48 hours. You can head on over just now. Okay, here comes the fun part. Now, you take this. Oh, wow. Look at the cool shoes. Okay. Now, oh, look, there's my feet. Now, I walk looking. Here's the deal. Hold the prism like this. So, all you see is your feet through the prism. And walk around. Okay, give it a try. Mm -hmm. I think I'm good to walk. Oh my god. I'll see you later. I can do it. I can try to do my feet. I'm climbing it up. Oh yeah, with the mask. It's hard not to. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. You get one minute to practice. And then here's the deal, listen. Each one of you. Listen. Sam, Sam, stop. Everyone stop walking for a moment. Stop walking. I need to. Uh, you have to look through the prism. No holding on to the sides. We will space people out on the sides. And your job is if it looks like they're going to fall, you grab them. You got it? Okay? Everyone got that? So, and what will happen is we'll have people spread out on the stairs. You'll go down, turn around, and here's the key. If you, when you get down, a lot of people want to go, oh, that's good, and then go up. If you keep the prism here, the going down to turning around, you'll feel another, like, oh, reorientation, and there will be a difference coming up. Uh, and do you remember, it's like, uh, how many of you felt the bend when we did this? You'll notice each person processes their senses differently, especially in this case, a sense of balance, a sense of vision, and a sense of motion. And there is certain patterns I've noticed between who um, has an easy time going up or down, and who has a more challenging time. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It yeah, has right. to do more with how you process your body movement. Yeah. All the details. There's reasons for these things. Do you want to explain to I, I have... Please I got, do. I have yeah, there's a lot going on in this. and I, There's a very famous piece of research related to this, and I happened to meet the woman who was the advisor on this. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Yay! <laughs> but like, it is getting to be close to its final tick, I would say. You're sort of taking your focus here, you are dialing it in, right? And so, you're feeling all around, and then you know that that spot is it. Now watch what I do. I take my thumbs here, and I use them to give a little bit of power. Still sticking out. The fine line between too much and too much. Okay. So, it's going to do a nice job at scooping. This one's pretty sharp. It's doing, it's doing the trick. So, what I do here is I'm often, when you're carrying, one hand is kind of pushing the bevel against the wood, and the other is sort of steering it through, right? So it's kind of the meeting of opposing forces. And the thing to do is just kind of put it on a surface on 
carry it down. And the nice thing about switching from chopping to carrying is that a lot of times you can put right on one of those little ridges from the top, like that ridge right there. These students have taken plaster casts of their own face and then have built up different features with clay and plaster casted those as well to make characters from the tragedy Antigone. And later we'll do the same with characters from the comedy The Imaginary Invalid and compare the different features of these exaggerated masks. In the tragedy and comedy main lesson, we study the evolution of drama from ancient Greece to the modern theater of today. And in working with physical movement and gesture and speech and artistic exercises, we find multiple entry points for many different grade levels to come to a better understanding of the difference and the boundaries between the physical and the emotional worlds and the evolution of human consciousness. We're on page 44. Oh, not 44. And we need someone to be Baleen, someone to be Argon, someone to be Endelique, someone to be Mr. Diaphorus, and why not Thomas Diaphorus as well? One, two, three, four, five, and someone to be Toinette. All right, here we go, starting at scene seven with Argon saying, my love. Oh, that's me. Yes, my love. This is son of Mr. Diaphorus. Is that his name? Yeah. Diaphorus. <laughs> my bad. Oh, it's Hi. me. Where are we? Madam. No, I thought she was Thomas. Oh, you are. Oh, you are Thomas. Madam, it is with justice that heaven has granted you the title of stepmother, for we see in your face. Interruption? Yeah, there you go. Okay, but am I being both of Mr. Diaphragm and Bailey? Sure. As a, okay. Sir, I am delighted to have you from here opportunity to enjoy the honor of seeing you. Let's, let's, hold on, let's redo that. So you are launching into one of your three planned speeches. You've got these things memorized, it's all gonna be okay. You've got them memorized. And Bailey, and you're just interrupting, right? Because you've got stuff to do. You're gonna move it on quickly. And so you need to be well on the way to interrupt Thomas. And when you get interrupted, Thomas, you are incapable of getting back in because you've got it memorized. And so if someone interrupts you, you don't actually know what you're saying. You just know where you are in the memorized spot, right? So let's see that interaction. Thomas, Madam. Madam, it is with justice that heaven has granted you the title of stepmother, for we see in your Sir, family. I am delighted to have you come here opportunely to enjoy the honor of seeing you. For we see in your face, for we see in your face. Madam, you have interrupted me in the midst of my period, and that has confused my memory. Thomas, reserve this for another opportunity. My pet, I would have wished to be here just now. Ah, madam, we have lost a great deal in not having it. You have a choice when you get up toward the top. So when you look at their spokes, there's probably three inches extra at the top, two to three inches. So the top of this basket will be right about here. Can you see that? So when I get up into this area, I might want to add some different um, weaving uh, material that gives a little color. So I have all of these. Um, it's the same type of thing that you're using as a reed that's the same size and shape but it's called smoke, so they actually brown it in some sort of smoking oven. Um, so it gives you a little color at the top. It's a little, you can have a little interest as the little decoration as you go up. Can I use one now? Yep. Yeah. So the same thing, you're just going to soak it and overlap it as you've been doing. We're done. Overlap yeah, about four spokes. Do you have any? I have to use your dark. Let Okay, that was our observation morning sample of classes. And I hope you enjoyed that peek into that wide variety of subjects. I wanted to make a note that the community lunch segment that you saw was a very special thing that we got to do recently. Our lunch program is on hold because of COVID. But um, the community lunch is a, is a longstanding tradition that we have had throughout the year um, in non-pandemic times 
we would bring the whole upper school community together to have a lunch that is prepared by, um, this time it was prepared by two, um, an alumni parent and a current parent who so lovingly and generously volunteered to prepare and serve this lunch. So we were so grateful to have that opportunity as the restrictions are starting to ease to be able to come back together and share a meal outdoors and have that tradition be reinstated. Um, so now I would love to introduce all of you to our faculty panelists who are joining us now to answer your questions. And I will let these teachers introduce themselves, tell you their names and what they teach and anything else they would like to share. And then after they introduce themselves, you are welcome to begin sending in your questions through that Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen. So on my screen first, I have Emily Laird, if you would like to begin by introducing yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Emily Laird and I teach fine arts here at the Lake Champlain Walder School. I loved watching the day in the life. I found that, um, oh, it was really fun. Um, so I'll be able to answer questions. I've been teaching at the school for a long time and I have loved working here and watching all the students go through, through all the 17 years that I've been here. And uh, below me is Melendi Comey. Hi, I'm Melendi Comey and I've been teaching here as well for a long time, almost 20 years. I've been teaching mostly in the high school and the middle school for the past 16 or more years. Um, I teach our uh, crafts and practical arts, we call it, because it's, it's a wide range of things, mostly in the textile area. So, so knitting, weaving, sewing. Um, and then I also teach basket making, which you saw a video of. I teach bookmaking um, and three-dimensional clay sculpture. Those are my main, I've, I've taught many other things, but um, I love teaching the crafts to children, um, to students and teenagers. Um, it's one of my loves. Thank you. Rebecca, would you like to go next? Good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hopkinson. I am a middle school teacher. I have had the same class from first through eighth grade, and they are eighth graders this year. And I will go on in the future to be uh, circling through middle school grades. I'm a main lesson teacher, which means I have taught um, the main portion of our, or the morning portion of our lessons for the last eight years since I've been at LCWS. I also teach the cyber civics curriculum, which is a digital citizenship curriculum that we have at our school, and as well as um, anti-bias classes in a program we call Unbound. Great, thank you. And Ms. Fuchs, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. Um, I am Emily Fuchs, and I teach mainly humanities in the high school, um, English and some history. And I also have been this year teaching French in the lower grades, so grades one through eight. And so it's been exciting to get to see the whole range of, of ages and developments in our school. And I am really looking forward, well, I'm glad that you've gotten a chance to get a window into our classes. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. So now I'll start to take some questions that are being sent into the question and answer feature. And if you uh, look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A and you can type in any questions that you have there. So the first question that I have coming in is, how do the grades work together? And how does the program accommodate different ages, stages and learning styles in group learning? Who would like to speak to that question? I can start from a middle school perspective. So this year we have um, grades six through eight all sharing different lessons at various times. So at times there will be 
um, a sixth and seventh grade combined class or a seventh and eighth grade combined class. Our eighth grade has also been um, a part of some groups with the high school kids. And um, in those instances, it's, a, it's the teacher's job to figure out where they are in their development to, um, to make sure that everyone's getting what they need. So for instance, I might assign a block project and have different um, curriculum expectations for the younger kids than I do for the older kids. And um, yeah, somebody else wanna take it from there? <laughs> Go ahead, Emily. Um, last year, I was part of the main lesson that was uh, eighth, ninth and 10th grade called uh, migrations. And that was uh, very similar to what Ms. Hopkinson was talking about. Um, I was the arts component to this immersion project and Ms. Deal Noble, who was teaching the main lesson, had um, some different expectations depending on the age group um, with length of writing with questions answered. And um, in the arts, I've taught one class this year where I actually had the ninth and 10th graders doing one project and I had the 11th graders working with a different medium, uh, sort of like a one room schoolhouse situation. So they were each able to um, uh, get what they needed in this, these building blocks that I wanted them to have in the fine arts. Um, and it was interesting. I think also, I'm, I'm sure you saw some of it as well in the open house in the tragedy and comedy class that one of the one of the reasons that I built the class in the way that I did was knowing that I would have this age range from nine, ninth grade to 11th grade. And so I intentionally included a lot of um, artistic work, a lot of um, physical, physical movement, gesture work, um, speech and presentation work. Um, fine art work and those kind of allow the students to access the material from wherever they are and the medium itself can help and deepen and teach them what we're studying as well. And then again, like Ms. Laird and Ms. Hopkinson said, um, the 11th graders are doing independent projects where they have a little more freedom to choose something to go deeper into, whereas the younger students have a little more structure and have um, a product at the end of the block that I've you know, given them the, the steps for. So they can build these capacities to then in 11th grade or you know, towards in, in 10th grade as well for some students, be able to have these independent, um, independent experiences. Thank you, all of you for that answer. <clears throat> Another question that I have is about the crafts program. What is the purpose of the crafts program? And how does this program support the high school curriculum? So, um, Melindy, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Um, so the purpose of the crafts program is definitely not to make them into craftspeople. I'm not trying to make them basket makers for life or, or any of the crafts that I teach. It's really to awaken them to working with their hands um, and to also awaken them to how things around us are made. Um, I always, at the end of my basket class, say to the um, students, what do you think you could sell your basket for? Um, and we, it ends up in a conversation about, are people paid fair for their work? You know, Because we know we can go to a store and buy a basket for under $10, and that person put in maybe not as many hours as an eighth grader would, but you know, a bit of their time. Um, and I think that I love that they, when they learn how to weave, they think more about cloth and the, and the capacities and um, all of that. And I think the second part of the question is that we believe in the Walder um, curriculum that um, having students work with their hands and working with fibers or, or natural materials around them connects them not only to the world, but through the natural materials, but it also, you know, the, we've, the research has, but is extensive about how working with your hands actually helps through your brain growth. And I think that that's what I'm, I feel like I'm helping the academic program and those teachers by awakening and, and the synapses in their brain that are really helping them to think more clearly. It's also a, a really um, excellent place for problem solving. You have so many problems when you're working on a craft that you have to work through. 
And that's so um, important for students to have a good problem solving uh, capacity. Can I add something? Yes. Um, and more from the perspective of having two uh, children have gone through the program, one of whom was very handwork oriented. And, you know, she, uh, her curtains are the wrong length in her house. So she just stitches them up and hems them. And, and for her, that was a real, a natural place to go. And, and she really thrived and has taken it into uh, different things, areas in her life with that fine tuning. And one of my, my children, it was a real challenge for him. He was much more in his head and um, and yet there too, although he might not seek it out later in his life, I really feel like it helped um, ground him and center him. And that's something that he took forward into his adulthood. Great. And Ms. Laird, I wonder if you might answer the same question that's about the um, crafts program, but apply that to the fine arts program and how the fine arts supports the whole high school curriculum and what's the purpose of us teaching all of these fine arts classes? Well, um, in the, the fine arts classes that I teach, we start with a foundation of drawing class, move to watercolor, acrylics, and oils. And those that's the general arc that I'd like students to leave with. And then there are electives um, where in 11th and 12th grade, or maybe other options where students can choose something they want to go more deeply into. Um, I think that you know the science classes are built a lot on observation, you know, working with observation. And so when the students are drawing a still life, they are observing, and they're not observing in the um, in the scientific way, perhaps, um, but they are still working with observation, and then they sort of get to interpret that different than you may work with in science, but you get to interpret that drawing in a certain way. What are you choosing to emphasize? Um, what's your individual drawing like? What do you draw out of that? And then to see your classmates doing the same, looking at, at similar objects and having a very different result, which really speaks to the individuality of the students. So um, I think that working with observation, I think um, going into a quiet place and, and discovering that while a student may or may not name themselves as an artist, art is something to be learned. You don't go into a French class and say, oh, you know what, I, I haven't taken French one. I can't speak French. I will never speak French. We, we think of learning in a lot of things, um, but sometimes with the arts, we assume we are or we are not artists. And when each student comes in, I, my assumption is they are an artist and they will be able to do these projects and, and they do do them and they discover something. They might discover a capacity that they didn't know they had. Um, they get to see how, how individual each person's art expression is. And it also provides a space in their day. There's problem solving too, where you look at your piece, especially the long-term projects and you say, what's working? What's not working? What can I do to make it work? Like editing a paper. Like um, there are some very similar, um, very similar components to um, what's happening in the academics. And sometimes a student has trouble finding it in the academics, like understanding the relevance can discover the relevance of what they're doing in the academics by seeing how that also plays out in the arts. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so another question has come in about our music program and we don't have Mr. Olson here, but I wonder if anyone could speak to how music fits into the curriculum since we are kind of on an arts, um, topic right now before we move into a different topic. Um, I know that we don't have um, singing happening so much this year, but since that is something that is um, integral to the curriculum in other years, can anyone speak to that a little bit? 
I'm happy to start and say a little bit about it. Um, and one of the things that I can see in the same with what Emily just said about some people say, you know, I am not an artist. And we're, what we're asking students to do here is to challenge that and to have everyone come, across, come against any subject that they say, oh, I'm not that. And I think um, music is another place where that happens, that the students have normally, not in, in these times, but normally have um, choral classes throughout the year. And there's something about the community building aspect of singing and playing music together that even if you are a grumpy teenager sometimes, it doesn't feel good to be out of harmony with the group when you're singing. And it has this kind of natural, a natural community building sense when you are singing together that my part matters. And also I am part of a group and what I do is both integral to the group and I need the group in order to do what I'm doing. And so just like with the art program and the craft program, there are these ways in which what we're working with is not just the subject material itself, um, but these inner capacities for the students. And so that's maybe more of a bird's eye view, but <laughs> I can't speak to too much of the specifics. That's great. Thank you. Can I add to that too? Um, there's also a way that um, I think the singing, um, it can, uh, take you out of yourself, but in the best way, you know, where you might be, you might start focusing on what those notes are and, and the feeling of the music and stop maybe thinking about in that moment, something that you're rubbing against um, in another area of your life. And the faculty sing together. And when I came to the Waldorf school, I was not a singer. I would not sing. And it's through our faculty meetings and the singing that we've done together that I really, uh, learned how to uh, walk the talk musically that I had learned that I speak as an art educator that no actually it's it's taking the time to find the right note what is the right note oh oh you just people have to find the right note they're not just uh, it doesn't always naturally just come out so I learned a lot also as a as a faculty member in that direction thank you so much both of you so we'll move uh, a little bit away from the arts right now with this question. Um, your high school is in a different building on Bostwick Road, this is true. Our um, early childhood and lower school campus is on Turtle Lane in Shelburne. And the question is, so all the ninth through 12th graders take courses there? Um, the answer is yes. So our upper school, which we consider to be seventh through 12th grade, takes place on uh, the Bostwick Road campus. In the um, sometime during the sixth grade year, the sixth graders start to dip their toe into the um, idea of kind of shifting from lower school to upper school. So the sixth graders are, um, since it's close to the end of their, their sixth grade year, they are at our upper school campus right now. Um, but yes, those are two different campuses. We're about a mile apart, so a short drive, long walk, and they do occasionally make that long walk. Um, for better or for worse. And um, so the final part of that question is, how rigorous is your math and science curriculum? So um, to answer that question, I will say, first of all, I have um, something I'll post in the chat here. This is, um, this is a post that was written by an alum of ours who went on to study physics in graduate school and then astrophysics, obtained his doctorate in astrophysics and um, wrote this article just a few weeks ago to share with our community and with perspectives, his experience of being a Waldorf student who was interested in science. And so I think that part of the answer to that question is about the experiential nature of the science and the math curriculum. As you saw in the um, video, we do teach calculus, we teach physics. Um, optics is the class that you were uh, observing that the 12th graders are engaged in right now. So the content 
can be very rigorous. The approach is very hands-on and involves the experience on multiple levels of the students, just like all of our subjects. And I think that's part of the difference in how um, a Waldorf school approaches those particular subjects. Does any of the other faculty want to add to that at all? We don't have um, a math teacher here with us right now. Part of the difficulty of hosting an event like this during the school day is that um, our teachers are teaching. And so we have to um, have those who are available join us. But I'm also happy to connect anyone who wants to speak specifically with a math teacher with those teachers afterwards. I can just share a little bit of my experience having just been in a physics block. Okay. Um, these students, it would be one thing to sort of give them the definitions of um, how a motor works and uh, the nature of um, a, a circuit or a battery. The students made their own electromagnetic motors and um, the approach is very much through observation. So uh, we did a, a week on reflection and the nature of reflection. They observed candle shadows in a darkened room. Um, they observed what happened when um, a, a flat mirror was covered with baby powder and what happened when you cleared off in the center of that and looked within. Um, we studied uh, reflection and um, and then went in to talk about, about batteries and, um, and the students ended up uh, building their own little motors. Um, by the end of today, we had the students hanging on um, electromagnetic um, beam from, from the ceiling of our, of our post and beam building um, to show the strength of that electromagnetic building, um, electromagnetic um, force. So uh, it, it is very experiential and, um, and so they walk away with sort of this phenomenolo phenomenological experience of, of what does it mean um, to work with these materials. I also had the experience of sitting in, not, well, not sitting in, but co-teaching in a science block. Um, the 11th graders have studied botany in the past. And this is a, an immersive block so that in the mornings they are learning the Technology, technology, the terminology for for the plants in the natural world, and then I would be working with them, reading um, nature writers like um, Annie Dillard and Sigrid Olson, and then they in the afternoon they went and in their art classes, again worked with um, fine and handwork and crafts to produce something of their own that kind of expanded on the topic, and I think the big the big theme is making sure that what we are studying is not removed from the world around us so that we are going out into the field and looking at the plants and observing and and taking them apart and and really being aware of how things interact in a way that is um, not only within the classroom. Great, thank you. So another question is, can you describe what the program would look like for a virtual student attending only online? So um, first off, I will just say that um, we don't typically offer an, an online only, uh, we don't offer enrollments as in an online only program. However, we have this year had to make accommodations for students at different times of the year for various lengths of time. And I wonder if someone could speak to how that process um, has gone and has been going for um, the various grade levels. I can start again, although <laughs> I've got a lot to say. Um, the, so I work, this year I've worked pretty closely with the 12th grade and with um, their college application process and all the other things that happen 
with in the 12th grade year, there's been a no number of students who have had to, for one, run, one reason or the other, be remote for a certain amount of time. And what that has looked like for some classes has been independent studies. So for example, our movement classes, some of the practical art classes, there was one 12th grader who did a project on embroidery because she was really interested in it and she was going to be remote for a certain amount of time and made a plan with, with Melendi to work out what did she need to do, did the research for it, and then could sort of plan her own day in that class essentially. And for those types of classes that works so much better than having to phone into a class where everyone is already there and you have to, you know, sit and sew by yourself, for example. Um, and then for some of the other classes, we are able to have people um, join classes virtually, make sure they can see the board. We've recorded some of the classes as well for audio recordings. And I think this year has been, we've, we've been really, we've tried to be really attentive to the experience of on, like what does it feel like to have to, to zoom in or to Google meet in to all of the classes and making sure that we are adjusting, that it's not just we slap a computer in a room and let the student it, it, through the computer do the same thing because that becomes really exhausting and it's not nourishing in the way that we are we're hoping for our students. So there's often um, different assignments or adjusted assignments or um, things in that in that realm to help them to help them keep with keep with the content, keep with the theme, but be able to access it and in a in a real life way, even when they're virtual. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, I will only add that last year during lockdown, um, we did senior self portraits uh, virtually and it was far from ideal. Um, but at the same time, the um, given the fact that that it was a lockdown period, the relationship of the students really carried them and their experience up into that point. Uh, they were incredibly versatile in being able to figure out how to do their portraits. And we had a class time and they got paint sets. And that to me just spoke to the creativity of, okay, we have to do this a new way in this particular year. And, um, and they all rose to it. We all rose to it, which I thought was just exciting um, in terms of forging something new, not that that's a great way to do the do the work. Just like it's not great to do a self portrait with masks, but we go outside now, and you know that we have outdoor stations so they can take their masks off. Can I just add too that for for any time that I have a student who's remote for um, a certain amount of time, I I'll usually give them. A, a buddy to check in with. Um, social connectivity is so much a part of what we do and, and kids can feel pretty isolated when they're remote. So I'll of, often have a student who was in person, you know, give that the remote kid a call and just check in and see if there's anything that they need to process about what they saw um, from the day or, you know, just check in and see how they're doing. Great, thank you. So we have another question about our foreign language curriculum in, in middle and high school. And so I want to mention that while um, French has been our foreign language for um, quite a long time, we are um, working to expand our foreign language program to be a world languages program. And we are in the process of interviewing candidates for um, that role. So next year's foreign language program is a bit um, uncertain at the moment, but it will be, there will be details unfolding very soon. But um, Emily Fuchs, would you like to speak a little bit about the foreign language program as it has existed? Yeah, I think like Amy said, it's still in flux at the moment, um, but it 
our changes do come from this desire to open up the language curriculum in something that is not just a, a European language, for example. And so this year in this transition period, um, we had some students who chose to do some language learning online, which they could open up their choices. And so one student took Norwegian and another spent the year studying uh, modern Hebrew. And, um, and I think that it's really, it's really important for us as a school to be able to, to have a, to give our students a sense of beyond just the United States and foreign language is so critical in being able to do that. And we've had, um, in the past, we've had a number of exchanges to France and also previously to Germany. And that's something that we're still looking towards as, as we continue the, you know, the changes and adjustment of this program. Thank you so much. And Mr. Palmer has joined us just in time. Um, I know that some of our teachers might need to hop off in a few minutes. So I wanna just let you know that if you do have to leave to tend to lunch duties, um, feel free to just do so when you, when you have to go. Um, so Robert Palmer is one of our upper school teachers. Rob, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you um, teach and anything else you'd like to share? Sure. Um, so my name is Robert Palmer, much like the 80s rock star. Nice and easy name to remember. Uh, I teach woodworking and outdoor ed here. Um, the woodworking program starts in the fifth grade, goes all the way through the high school. And then outdoor ed um, starts in the sixth grade this year, although it's a new program. So we're looking forward to expanding that. And that also goes through the high school and culminates in some um, yearly outdoor adventure trips. Great. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is from myself because in the video that of uh, the observation morning video that was shown at the beginning, in the woodworking class, Rob, the students talked about um, in one of the high school woodworking projects that they got 10 feet of board. And can you describe what the project is and what the parameters are, what their, the expectations are? Yeah, this, this culminates from a project I did when I was getting my degree in furniture making and fine woodworking. I have a bachelor's of fine arts from the Vermont Woodworking School. Um, in fine woodworking and furniture design. And while at school, I had exhausted all the different classes that I could take and started designing my own classes. And I had a pile of scrap wood I was anxious to use. And one of those boards was 10 feet long. And I wondered, well, what can I do with 10 feet of a piece of wood? And um, so that along with another project that we used to do that proved to be a little bit more than we could bite off um, came out from those two classes came the 10 foot board project where I give the students one 10 foot long board and we go through the full design process starting with sketches, doing sketch designs, doing um, a series of one minute sketches. From those one minute sketches, we take about three or four, we expose those out to about a five minute sketch. And then from those, we pick one that feels like the thing we want to make and they typically make either a small table or a bookshelf. And it's been a really successful project. It's a lot of fun. And it focuses mostly on um, mortise and tenon joinery. And that's really what the focus of the high school program is all about. In the eighth grade, we sort of switch from using lots of hand tools, um, knives, gouges, things of that nature, making things like spoons and bowls. And we shift over to a much more joinery focus project is a three-legged stool. And so for our high school programs, almost all of the projects have been designed around joinery. How do we put two pieces of wood together firmly to make a larger object? It's more of an additive process than a reductive process. Um, so that's kind of what you were seeing in that video. You were watching one of our students chopping out the mortise for his mortise and tenon joinery with a chisel. Great, thank you so much. So another question that has come in is, is about the trips that students take. What are some kind of the trips 
that students typically take and how do they relate to the subjects that are being studied? Sure. Um, you could speak to that in some way, probably. Yeah, sure. Um, so I can speak to the outdoor ed type trips. And I think Emily could probably speak to some of the more academic trips. So, um, you know, before we even had a, an outdoor education program, we had a, um, a culture of doing really rigorous outdoor um, trips, focusing on outdoor adventure, living into the uh, rhythms of life on the trail, setting up camp every day, breaking down camp, cooking all of our meals on fires, um, and moving through uh, all manner of methods, hiking. Um, our 10th graders in the past have done winter camping trips in sometimes sub-zero freezing weather, and we managed to survive those. Um, and um, each year, the trips become a little bit more rigorous and a little bit more um, adventurous. Um, and this really ties in well with the outdoor education program, but it also gives us all kinds of opportunities to weave in their subject classes, um, as well as just develop a reverence for nature and life on the trail. And then there's much more than that that Emily can speak to that I've not been, a, been too uh, much a part of. I had... I, I've been on a lot of trips so far with classes and I think at this point I've, I've been on all the whole range that we've done in the past and I think what is really exciting is when we can take an outdoor education experience in nature use it to deepen something that we're doing in the classroom so I've taught the Odyssey for example while we are paddling along Lake Champlain and hospitality and that theme definitely takes on a different meaning when you have to ask someone to stay on their land because it's raining. Do you have to go to, uh, to a house and ask, can we stay here? We need, you know, we need some place to stay. Is it all right if we camp in your field? And so it's a really, it, it enlivens so much the idea of instead of this old mythological guy on the ocean, this is, this is a real theme that we still work with today. Thank you, Emily. I think that just really speaks to the whole approach to um, making the whole experience of education meaningful and applicable to the, the experience that's right in front of the students, that then that level of engagement and interest is what we see and hear from our graduates that um, they take with them into the rest of their lives, that that um, kind of ability to apply their learning and then extend it into what that whatever it is they're experiencing in their lives is what they really value. That is it for the questions for today. So I will thank our panelists, those who have already departed and the two of you who are still here. Thank you so much for coming to share your um, experience and um, perspective on our classes. Thank you all of you attendees for coming and joining us today to observe our classes. And we will send this recording out later for you to view another time and hope to see you again soon. Please reach out to me at, um, you can go to our website, lakechamplainwaldorfschool.org. You can send me an email. It's a Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N at lakechamplainwaldorfschool.org. And I'm happy to connect you with other teachers or answer any other questions that you have about our school enrollment or the programs. Thank you all.